Hey ladies, first I want to say thank you so much for 10k subscribers. I really appreciate your support and kind words and I love it when you share your own experiences in the comments too. It really helps everyone to see that we're not the only ones who get it. Today's topic is a very serious one and that is protecting your health, specifically in terms of physical intimacy. I'll try not to get too graphic but heavy themes will be discussed including chronic illness and unaliving oneself. These are the stories of a few women facing lifelong health consequences as a result of risky behavior. Following their stories, there will be three lessons. Let's begin. Gina Tu was born in the winter of 1992 in Memphis, Tennessee. She grew up with a younger brother, William, and an older sister, LaPortia, who she was very close with. Even in adolescence, she had a signature style marked by bright colors and fun accessories. She later described it as emo, goth, scene queen vibe, and attributes her alternative style to the darkness she was feeling inside. She ran away from home as a child and as young as 14, started hurting herself with sharp objects. At 16, she moved from Memphis to Ohio, and as soon as she turned 18, she left home for the Big Apple. Her time in New York was very eventful. She made great use of her creativity and studied at the Empire Beauty School in Manhattan. At 20, she was on the TLC show Love, Lust, or Run. It was a makeover show, basically a remake of Snog, Mary, Avoid. They showed Gina's photo to people on the street and asked if they loved, lusted after, or wanted to run away from her. Let's just say, love was not in the air. By then, she had added several tattoos to her look, including her signature neck piece. Hostess Stacy London gave her a less edgy look. Gina was very nice and polite, but years later said that the experience made her feel really bad about herself. It didn't take long for her to go back to her original style, and that style worked well for her. While working toward her beauty license, she did a lot of modeling. She was small in size, but her unique look made her hard to miss. Some of her work includes posing for doll scale, spray ground, and inked mag. However, her time in the city was not always pleasant. She was homeless and essayed more than once. Despite this, Gina was very resilient and continued to pursue her creative endeavors. She got more and more popular as a print model and found significant work as a video girl. She also made her own music. I've heard her song, Can You Feel Me? and I think she has a beautiful voice. As she got more popular in the industry and on social media, she started to make more popular friends. She's been linked to celebs including Chris Brown, Diplo, Chief Keef, Slim Jimmy, and more. In 2015, she was spotted on a date with Nick Cannon. Years later, something else put her name in the headlines, but it wasn't good. By 2022, Gina had started to feel ill. She said, I just got sick one day, started fainting, fevers, then I got really weak. I was going to the doctors and no one knew what was wrong. They just kept assuming cancer, cervical cancer, lesions. And then I had some doctors say, no, you're perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with you. Finally, one doctor ran some tests and asked her, did you know you have AIDS? She did not know she had AIDS. She didn't even know she had HIV. She hadn't been getting tested. The doctor said she looked like she'd had it for almost a decade already. She called all of her previous partners and none of them had it. To this day, she still doesn't know when or how she got it. She wasn't only engaging in risky bedroom activities. She could have contracted it from a dirty needle. She claimed she received several of her tattoos for free outside of parlors. When she got her diagnosis, she was very close to losing her life and facing a slew of complications. She found herself weighing only 65 pounds at 5'4", struggling with incontinence, losing her hair, unable to walk, and becoming blind in her left eye. Her diagnosis also took a huge toll on her mental health. Then, as if things couldn't get worse, soon after announcing her AIDS diagnosis, her sister, the Portia, suddenly got very ill and soon passed away. She had developed a rare condition called fibrosing mediastinitis and left behind her three young children. Overwhelmed with so much grief, Gina did not want to be alive anymore and she tried not to be here more than once. She said something very interesting about her sister in an interview with Plus Life Media. When asked how she kept herself from worrying too much, she had this to say. Honestly, my sister passed away once I was out of the hospital, but still not doing so well. I lost her when I first went to go see her. And she's been praying for me so much. She's very Catholic. I feel like sometimes 
I feel like maybe she gave herself away for me to survive. That's what kind of keeps me going because there was no reason she should have left. She was doing great and I was the one that was so ill. I feel like she might have did that for me. It came as a shock to everyone that Gina survived. The doctors had told her mother twice to prepare her funeral arrangements, but she miraculously pulled through. Her road to recovery was long and painful, but with medication, transfusions, and physical therapy, she started to work toward a new normal. After a year of treatment, she took her first steps with assistance. And today at 29, she could sit around with the help of leg braces and a walker. A fan also gifted her a really nice electric wheelchair that she uses for longer trips. And she surpassed her goal weight of 105 pounds. Unfortunately, even after several surgeries, she did not regain vision in her eye. However, she has reached an undetectable HIV viral load, and as long as she continues to take her daily medication, she won't transmit the virus. She spends her time making content, documenting her recovery journey, and traveling. She's also trying for a baby with her boyfriend. You know how I feel about giving boyfriends babies, but that's not the point today. Gina's life will never be the same, but thankfully, she still has a life to live. The same cannot be said for everyone who gets AIDS. While she has lost a lot, things can only get better from here. Our next story focuses less on the individual because there are actually several people in the story. But let's start in November 2015 with a woman named Quantasia Sharpton. The young college student had just turned 19 and she decided to celebrate her birthday by going out with some girlfriends to see Usher in concert. She got all dolled up, adorned with a birthday crown, and headed to Atlantic City. Allegedly, she was picked out of the crowd and invited backstage. There, a security guard told her that Usher had seen her and was interested. Then they exchanged numbers and she returned to her room at the day's end. It wasn't long before she got a call from a blocked number asking where she was staying. An hour later, the R&B singer arrived. They chatted for a bit before getting intimate. Then he promptly left and to her dismay, she never heard from him again. To cope with being ghosted, she started to go online and read the group details about him and was horrified to find out that he allegedly had genital herpes. She said, quote, I was upset by the report because I never would have consented if I had known. She decided to take legal action and hired high profile attorney Lisa Bloom. Lisa has represented women in allegations against Bill O'Reilly and worked as an advisor for Harvey Weinstein before stepping down. As for Quantasia, she filed her lawsuit in California, initially asking for $10 million. She had not contracted herpes, but was suing for the fact that he allegedly exposed her to it without telling her. And she wasn't the only one suing Mr. Raymond. Another woman, as well as a man, were alongside her. The man remained anonymous, but claimed that he and Usher had been intimate inside a spa in Los Angeles. The other woman was eventually revealed to be a jazz singer named Laura Helm. She claimed to have been friends with Usher for years and alleged that they slept together for the first time in Georgia, then a couple weeks later in New Orleans. A few days after that, she felt an unusual bump in her cheek, followed by a painful bump in her genitals. When she initially got tested for herpes, it came back negative, but it turned out that her test was done too soon to give an accurate result. When she retested and discovered that she did contract herpes, the $10 million suit was doubled to $20 million. She also claimed to have had a stillbirth as a result of the infection. In 2019, Usher settled with his three accusers for an undisclosed amount and they cannot sue him for this again. Hopefully that'll be the last time someone has to sue him for infecting them, but it actually was not the first. Not long after his divorce from Tamika Foster in 2009, he allegedly infected another woman named Maya Fox Davis. She was a celebrity stylist and was actually a bridesmaid at Tamika and Usher's wedding. She alleged that at some point into her situation with the singer, he told her that he had noticed some symptoms in his genitals and went to the doctor. He then tested positive for herpes, but instead of disclosing this information to her, he lied and said that he had tested negative. After his initial outbreak, he showed no other symptoms, so she assumed he had gotten rid of whatever he had and they continued sleeping together unprotected. Three weeks later, she woke up feeling very sick with a fever, chills, headache, body aches, and painful lesions and blisters in her genitals. She went to urgent care and had an IgM test. The results confirmed a recent herpes infection. Usher wrote her a check for her medical bills, which came out to over $2,700. 
Additionally, telephone and online chat records showed him apologizing for infecting her and telling her he would take care of things. She went on to say that she, quote, feels that her health and body have been ruined and she has suffered severe emotional distress and has been extremely depressed knowing there is no cure. In California, where the complaint was filed, it is illegal to knowingly infect someone with an STI without disclosing your status. In December of 2012, Usher settled with her for $1.1 million. Our last story also involves a settlement, but it was a much more complicated case. In 1985 in Ireland, a little girl named Kat was born. Katrina White would grow up to become a demure woman with big dreams. At 22, she moved to LA to work as a makeup artist. She did both glam and special effects makeup, as well as hair. A few years into her new life in California in 2012, she met a very famous man on a movie set. This man, who was literally twice her age, was the Canadian actor Jim Carrey. They had an on and off relationship for several years and it was toxic in many ways. But what I want to focus on is her allegations that Jim infected her with multiple STDs, including oral and genital herpes. In 2013, she sued him and they settled out of court for an undisclosed amount. Unfortunately, Katrina took her life in 2015 by taking painkillers and sleeping pills that were prescribed to Jim. He had acquired them under the pseudonym Arthur King. Kat had been struggling with her mental health for several years and ended her life right after the third anniversary of her father's passing. Still, her estranged family sued Jim. He said that settling with Kat in 2013 was a mistake, that he did so not out of guilt but because, quote, mounting a public defense is a very costly and painful process and, he would hold a place of empathy and forgiveness for Kat. After her passing, a note on her iPad from 2013 was recovered in which she wrote things to Jim including, quote, you introduced me to Coco, prostitutes, mental abuse, and disease. You have not thought about the stigma I have to live with for the rest of my life. You gave me HSV and HPV. It ruins a girl's life. However, it was also uncovered that Kat had put her name on a friend's clean test results because she had no evidence of testing negative before Jim. However, she maintained her accusation until the day that she passed, literally. Right before taking her life, she hand wrote a note to Jim, a note in which she would have had nothing to gain by lying. Here are some of the things that were on her mind in her final moments. I feel like this is the only chance I have left to get closure. I wanted an apology to say, I gave you this. Intentional or not, I gave it to you. I understand that this is something that will affect you for the rest of your life, the future relationships, or lack of because of this. Instead of that, I was disrespected, degraded, called a W-H-O-R-E, an opportunist, threatened. This has really changed my life forever. People have bad experiences and breakups. It's hard, but with time they move on. Add in disease? How does someone move on and meet someone new? I am damaged. I am disgusting. When I shower, I feel sick. Getting turned on? What's that? Definitely not something that happens to me anymore. I will always be damaged goods and have a stigma attached. Once her family sued, and by family I mean her mother and her husband, Jim said that not only did he not give Kat any STIs, he has never even had an STI. Her family's attorney contested that obviously implausible statement and claimed to have records showing that Jim tested positive for chlamydia, hepatitis A, and HSV 1 and 2 in 2013. The attorney alleged that the actor used the pseudonym Jose Lopez, similar to how he used a fake name to acquire the pills that ended Kat's life. Jim countersued the family and the case was eventually dismissed. It's unknown whether or not he paid another settlement. Only two people have ever known the truth, and sadly, only one is still here today. Let's get into the lessons now. Lesson one, ignorance is not bliss. There's a lot of misinformation about STIs out there. P.S. I'm not a doctor, just a lady who knows how to conduct research, and I suggest you conduct your own research on this too. Our public school systems and even our parents usually don't teach us enough about staying safe, but that's not an excuse to make poor choices. If you're grown enough to be getting in bed with someone, then you're responsible for educating yourself on all that comes with that. Here's some information that I was never taught in health class. There are actually eight herpes viruses that infect humans. 
For example, the varicella zoster virus causes chickenpox and shingles, and the Epstein-Barr virus causes mono. The two we talked about today are the herpes simplex viruses called HSV-1 and HSV-2. HSV-1 is referred to as oral herpes because it usually infects the mouth. HSV-2 usually infects the genitals. However, while uncommon, it is possible to get HSV-1 on your genitals and HSV-2 on your mouth. You can actually get either type anywhere on your body, including in your eyes. If someone has cold sores, then they have the herpes simplex virus, and it is a huge misconception that it can only be spread when someone has an active lesion. That is not true. Viral shedding can occur with or without a sore, and even someone who has never had symptoms can be contagious. You're more susceptible to contracting it if you have a weakened immune system. Another risk factor is simply being a woman. And most of the time, STIs are asymptomatic. While women are less likely to show symptoms than men, we are more likely to contract STIs. This can have negative consequences for fertility in both genders, but it's even more dangerous for women in terms of reproduction. If a woman has, or even worse, contracts an STI while pregnant, she puts her baby's health at risk. And that's how there are newborn babies with HIV. We really shouldn't judge or make assumptions about people who have these illnesses. More than half of U.S. adults carry the virus for oral herpes, and the majority of cases were acquired in childhood. Of course, if you don't already have it, you'll want to keep it that way. But that doesn't mean you should judge people, especially when you don't know their story. STIs do not discriminate. They don't care how pretty, rich, smart, famous, kind, or young you are. Idea Broadbent, the little girl born with HIV who went on the Oprah show in the 90s, she passed this year. 80 supermodel Gia Karanji passed from AIDS. No one is invincible, so please prioritize your health. Make sure you see someone's test results before getting in bed with them, and even then, stay vigilant and use safety precautions. Also keep in mind that it takes time for infections to show up on tests. Laura Helm initially got a false negative because she took the IgG test too soon. It usually takes 12 to 16 weeks for enough of those antibodies to develop. An HIV antibody test can take up to 90 days. There's a lot of information to be learned about STIs. Take the time to educate yourself so that you can make informed decisions about your body. Lesson two, watch what you consume. When you're trying to get a healthy snatch body, you don't eat a bunch of greasy, fatty foods. So if you want a healthy mind and spirit, you want to be consuming healthy content as well. The music you listen to and the content you watch seeps into your subconscious mind. And then you affirm those messages either in your head when a song or scene gets stuck on repeat or with your tongue when you recite those words out loud. If abstinence is something you want to start or maintain, but you've been struggling, pay attention to the kind of content you're consuming. Does your favorite show have a casual sex scene every 10 minutes? Don't even get me started with corn. Are all the women you follow on Instagram twerking in thongs and promoting their OnlyFans? They call them influencers for a reason. Sexuality is a natural, healthy thing, but as with any other facet of your energy, it's sacred. You diminish the value of anything when you give it out for free and let just anyone have access to it. If you want to make a change in your life, you have to be intentional. That leads to the last lesson. Number three, set your boundaries before you're in tempting situations. I want you to sit down by yourself and think about what you are and aren't willing to do before certain requirements have been met. For example, maybe you're okay with kissing and cuddling. That's as far as you want to go until you're married. Or maybe your barrier to entry is just being in a committed relationship. If nothing else, I want you to be clear about what your boundary is and why that's your boundary. Maybe your why is that every time you slept with a guy without commitment, he ghosted you. So now you can set the boundary that he doesn't get the physical intimacy he wants until you get the commitment you want. Even the sweetest gentleman will want to sleep with you. And nine times out of 10, they won't pass up the opportunity if you offer it for free. They'll take it and then just go commit to the woman who made them wait. Be honest with yourself about what you really want. I know the traditional values aren't cool nowadays, but we also live in a society that promotes sexy red and her impending STI lip gloss line. Let the loss be lost and find your own truth. If you need help getting clarity on what you should do, go inward. Meditation, prayer, journaling, whatever method works for you. And you can reassess your boundaries, but let that happen in isolation with a clear mind. Even the strongest person is not going to think straight when they're in the face of temptation. That's what temptation is there for, to knock you off your path. 
but you can beat it with strategy. Know your limits. Some people can get under the covers, kissing a man they're attracted to with slow jams playing in the background and still not go all the way. Good for them, but not everyone can do that. Don't let people manipulate you by saying you're immature or weak for having limits. If you know you can't handle going to a hot guy's place alone at night, then don't go to his place. That's not weak, that's smart. Anyone who shames you for that just wants to get you in a vulnerable position. Whether that's the guy that wants to sleep with you or a jealous girl who wants to see you get hurt. Narcissists hate boundaries. And boundaries are not just for other people. The ones you set with yourself are even more important. That's how you build self-respect. Whatever barriers you have to put up to keep yourself on the right path, the end result is what matters. You don't need to tell everyone what you're battling with either. Depending on what it is, you might not have to tell anyone. Use your discretion, but when in doubt, keep it to yourself. I hope you found this information useful. You only get one body and you are the only one responsible for keeping it safe. So please respect yourself and protect yourself. One last thing, the media example for today is the 2013 Tyler Perry film, Temptation, Confessions of a Marriage Counselor. I won't spoil it, but if you've seen it, let me know what you think in the comments. And let me know what your thoughts are on this topic in general. Thanks for watching. Until next time, bye.